couple of years ago, I was on a plane with a co-worker of mine, and um, I was reading Randy Harris's then newest book, uh, Soul Work, and the flight attendant saw us doing this, saw me reading this, and she um, said, is that, is that about religion or whatever? And I said, yes, actually, it's a, it's a preacher friend of mine. And she said, oh, a Christian, is, is he anything like Joel Olstein?" And I was like, yes, in fact, he is very much <laughs> like Joel Olstein." <laughs> which uh, I've told that to Randy, and he just loves that. And I'm telling you this because yesterday, Randy, during his class, told you to buy a copy of my book, and he said if, if you buy a copy of, his, of my book that you should buy two copies of his book. And I just want you to know the word on the street is that it's kind of like Joel Olstein. So, I mean, I understand that he sells a lot of books too, Randy. I guess if you, But that flight attendant, I was actually going to tell you this story before I heard about... Um, about Randy doing that, but that flight attendant, after, after she asked that question, she said, well, what do you do? And I told her that I was a preacher, and so she gets in really close, and she says, wait, are you a big deal? And my coworker buddy was like, immediately, like, no, he is definitely not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, which I'm obviously not. And then she says this, she goes, is it a good church? What a great question. I wish everybody had people asking them that question. I wish people who looked at our churches were constantly saying the thing that was on their mind. Is it a good church? Is it good for the world around you that your church gathers together to worship? Because it should be. It should be good news that you believe the gospel whether people believe it or not. It should be good news that you worship this God who actually believes certain things about the world and the way the world should be, whether other people around you believe that or not. And of course we want to share our faith. Of course we want to tell this great story about this loving God who's making the world new. But whether people believe that story or not, it should be good news for them that we believe it. Is it a good church? You know the way the Bible opens up? is that God actually creates the world, and then he gives Adam and Eve responsibilities of naming, which is such a funny thing, right? Like God's been naming stuff up until this point, but for some reason he gives them the responsibilities, and we're not always good at that. I had a buddy who was an uh, inner city ministry, and um, he, met, he met this family. who The dad's name was Gus. Their oldest son was named Gus. Their second son was named Gus. Their daughter's name was Lugus, and... <laughs> And then their fourth kid was named Steve. I kid you not. <laughs> it's like one of these things is not like the other one. But God asked this, these people to, um, to name because He's actually inviting them into a certain way of life. He's actually inviting them into a partnership. He actually wants us to partner with what He's up to in the world. And the times that God gets cranked up, God is not an angry God, but when He gets cranked up, He's very slow to it. It's almost always because we fail to realize what he's up to in the world and how our relationship with him is connected with that partnership. So like in the prophets, when the prophets get really you know, angry, riled up, here's the kind of things they say in Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah is actually going to say, you know what your problem is? Your pro if you could put that slide up. Your, the problem is, is that you, um, you go to these fasts and then you don't go to the next one. You, you don't follow through with what you're learning about who I am. And so he says, Declare to my people the rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what's right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions, and they seem eager for God to come near them. Next slide. We, why have we fasted, they say, and you've not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? But on the day of fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Now this is where it gets touchy. Because the Bible doesn't seem to have a problem with actually getting into the nitty-gritty of our day-to-day -day life. I mean, it seems like the Bible likes to talk about the reality that we try to make not a spiritual thing, right? He says, you do all this stuff saying it's religious, and then you go out and you live in a way that doesn't honor God. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, and it's striking each other with wicked fists. Some of you are thinking, hey, I've been to that church. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Here's the thing about God. We're not tricking Him. 
It's not like he's like, oh, well, they're, well, they're at church on Sunday, so I guess you know, we're not invisible to him the rest of the week. And it actually grieves God when what we do on Sunday isn't connected to what we do the rest of our lives. Not because God is some angry ogre, because he actually knows this is the best possible way to live. That God's actually got this dream for the world that we can be a part of. We can be partners. And so I think we need to start re-looking at the questions we ask when we think of worship in church. Is it a good church? Would people around us think it's a good church? Would God think it's a good church? So in the book of Acts, there's this fascinating little story that is just brilliant. I mean, it's, it's like a sitcom in the book of Acts. Peter has been arrested. Um, Herod has learned the way to play the political game, and so he's arrested Peter. And when he sees that that pleases some of the Jewish religious leaders, um, he decides he's going to kill Peter. And so Acts starts off in Acts chapter 12, um, verses 1 through 4, or 1 through 5. It starts off with Peter in jail, fast, uh, like tied to two or three different security guards. Um, it, this is what it says in verse 3. Um, it says, when Herod saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to see Peter also after they'd killed James. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him into prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. So 16. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. But watch this. The church was earnestly praying for him. So basically, he is in maximum security prison. He's, it's during Passover. They're going to just kill Peter. He's got 16 people watching over him. If he's going to get out, it's going to have to be like some kind of Houdini moment, right? But Luke tells us that the church was praying for him. And then this happens. In verse 6, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the, in the cell. The angel struck Peter on the side and woke him up. So touched by an angel is not always a good thing. Quick, get up, he said. And the ch- Come on, that was funny. Quick, he said. Get up. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. I love that line. He had no idea that this was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And then Peter came to himself and said, Hey, looks like I just got out. Now I know without a doubt that I'm out. Um, I love this story because it makes Peter kind of look normal, human, right? I mean, we've all had those kind of moments where we're not sure what's happening or if we're, you know, it's a drink. When I was in college, I woke up with two guys standing over me with shaving cream and razors, and they were shaving my eyebrows. I was surprised, (laughs) but no one could tell, right? (laughs) It'll come in in a second, yeah. And, and so Peter is like in this moment where he's not really sure if all this is happening and he just looks like a regular, normal guy, not this like, you know, pillar of, a, you know, Bible character hero. And then it slowly dawns on Peter that he's no longer a prisoner, but he is a fugitive. So he needs some help. So he goes to get some help from the very church that had just been praying for him. And this is what happens, okay? This is genius. You know this story, but just pretend for a moment that you don't. In verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant, Rhoda, came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her, when she kept insisting that it was so. It must be his angel. So there's a lot of trust in this, faith, this prayer thing that they've got going. Um, but Peter kept on knocking. Um, Because he's got the keys to the kingdom, but not to Rhoda's house. And when they opened the door and saw him, yeah, that's... (laughs) Um, Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this. And he left in the morning for another place. And this is one of the things I appreciate about the book of Acts. It doesn't present the earliest Christians, the people that we historically have said, we would like to be like them. It doesn't present them as these kind of infallible people. 
It presents them very much like the people I'm familiar with, especially in the mirror. Um, there are people who are capable of great acts of faith in one moment and great acts of stupidity in the next. I mean, how many of you have sat in prayer meetings, you've prayed for stuff, and you've thought in the back of your mind, there's not a chance this is going to happen? And what's interesting is this happens at Passover time, a time when they celebrate God's activity of delivering people in captivity, right? And every one of them there would have known, like, this is, the, this is God had done this. The problem wasn't that they didn't think God could do it. They, the problem is they just don't think God was still doing it. I mean, that's the problem that they have. Now, we've evolved, and we're not like that anymore, but imagine being like that group of people, right? And one of the things that Acts is showing us is that God may be working in ways that are surprising right under your nose, and you might not be aware of it. But here's the question that this story draws out to me that's just brilliant, because this story is brilliant. The angel comes and gets Peter out of maximum security prison, right? Bust through gates and chains and guards and all that stuff. The gate opens by itself. And the angel doesn't open Rhonda's door or Rhoda's door. Like, what's that about? He gets him like all the way, and he doesn't open the last door. Why would that happen like that? Hold on to that for just a second. At one point in his ministry, Jesus is teaching his disciples. They've asked him how to pray. And so he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. We pray this every week at Highland. It's a great prayer. It'll really mess with you if you pray it. But when Jesus teaches that prayer, he's actually not reinventing the will. There was a Jewish prayer that was famous in that day. Um, and Jesus is actually teaching them that. He's saying, pray like that. Pray the way that you've grown up praying. Except he tweaks a couple of things. Just a couple. One of the things he tweaks is that Jesus removes the amen. The, the Kadesh, the prayer that they, they normally pray, he actually removed the amen from that. But they would have known. And I wonder, why would Jesus do that? But I think you already kind of intuitively know, the amen does something to us religious people, doesn't it? We gather together, we sing songs about this God who has done and is doing these great, amazing things. We pray for an hour for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, and then we say Amen. And we walk out, and we pretend like that's that, and then we go and live our lives. This is why, and Brandon and I talk about this a lot, this is why our worship matters. But it doesn't matter if we keep putting the amen back in it. If, if we close off what we do on Sundays, and every time we gather together, as we remember these stories, as we remember who God is, we close that off from our jobs, if we close that off from our families, from what we're trying to do, what God is trying to do in the world, is it a good church? It has nothing to do with what you even do on an hour on Sunday morning. Is it a good church? Are we re-adding the amen? I like the way the great New Testament scholar Scott McKnight says this. He says the thing about the Lord's Prayer is that prayer, this prayer does not stop with the amen. It rises to its feet and walks off. Our built-up yearning turned into action. The Lord's Prayer is not intercession. It is enlistment. But when was the last time you said the Lord's Prayer? Who said it in the last week? Did you say the amen? We kind of re-added it, didn't we? Because it helps us not actually have to live out the implications of what we say we believe, what we actually pray. So when I was um, homeschooled, growing up, 16 years old, my first girlfriend was this girl named Ashley. She was my first real girlfriend, the one that other people could see as well. Her name was Ashley, and I... <laughs> I don't need you sitting behind me. <laughs> this is my life. This is my job. We really are great friends. Um, anyway, so Ashley... I, I fell in love with Ashley after two weeks of dating because she met the criteria of being real and actually having some interest in me as well. Unfortunately, after a month of dating, her family decided to move to Colorado. Um, but I wasn't going to let a little thing like thousands of miles keep me away from the love of my life. So I decided to um, start calling her, and eventually that fell apart because my parents got the phone bill. And it was like hundreds of dollars, and <laughs> my parents just didn't get love, okay? So that was... <laughs> And so I did what every boy who grew up during the, as a teenager in the 90s did. I made Ashley a mixtape. 
complete with like boys to men and uh, you know different songs. And I started singing along. I don't know why I did this, but I would sing along on the mixtape. Then I would talk. I would write poetry. It was so bad. It was so bad. And, and then I would send that off to her, uh, you know, like, Ashley, I love you so much. You're, you're the one for me. And then every night I would get on my knees and I would pray. I would pray, dear God, if you're up there, if you're real, let me marry Ashley. And also, God, I, I would like to be an astronaut. If that's... <laughs> and, you know, I'm glad that the Spirit intercedes for us because <laughs> a couple of things. I think the Spirit was saying, look, God, he doesn't know what he was. It's, and he's scared of heights. He's not, he doesn't need to be an astronaut. But it also works the other way. And here's what I think this, what we do together, matters so much. Do you know what we're doing? We're coming alive to the work of God. That's why you've gathered together. You've attended to God so you can see and, and lean into his heart. And the Spirit intercedes for us. You know, I, I'm, I see Eric Trigestad. We actually went to Nepal for the Red Thread Movement together. You know what I've, I've noticed when we go to different places in the world where people are hurting? When we ask them questions like, what, what can we do? What can American Christians do? You know what they always say? Pray. You know what I always say immediately? <laughs> what really can we do? But they mean it. They mean it. Because here's what they know that we've forgotten. What we pray in our better moments is what we do. For them, prayer is not abandoning responsibility to the kingdom of God. It's opening ourselves up to it. You know, if the early Christians would have stopped praying for the widows and orphans, they might have actually stopped caring about them. And here's the reason what we do matters and what we do throughout the rest of the week matters. Prayer and activism have to go hand in hand, church. Because if they don't, here's what we have. Burn out activists and inactive believers. Aren't you tired of seeing that? People who care so much about good things, but they get so angry. They're so mad because maybe they think that their identity before God depends on their success in actually making this happen. Or people who are totally cool with God loves me, and it never moves past that. And imagine if you're God. Imagine if you see the world the way it is and you see all the suffering in the world and your plan for the world is actually the church to be the, the agency of grace and healing. What do you do? Is it a good church? Because this is what the dream of God has always been. Not that we would worship over mission or not that our, our mission would over would overtake our worship, but that the two would become one, that our mission would come out of the deep resources of worshiping the God who has never asked us to earn his love. And then our mission would be an outpouring of how good we've learned God actually is. This is how Acts ends. It fades to black. This is how the story of Peter ends. And Acts. This main character, the rock Jesus builds his church on, just fades to black. And you're left asking, what happens? When, what's the next thing? But Acts is basically saying, you are. You're the next thing. This is the next moment. Just don't say amen. Let's stand and worship.